This joint webinar between AMTS and the Canola Council of Canada is an interview with dairy nutritionist Daniel Scothorn, moderated by Dr. Essie Evans. It is quite a long webinar, so we've divided the recording into two parts. The first part will include the presentations by both Daniel and Essie, and the second part will be responses to questions from audience members. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, really great to see so many people on the webinar today. Um, thank you to, to Marianne and Daniel for that wonderful playlist we just listened to. I know that helped me uh, wake up this morning, so that was really great. Uh, so I just, uh, again, wanted to, to say thank you. Also wanted um, to be able to say thank you to AMTS and to Marianne for allowing the Canola Council to work with um, work with them in being able to share this webinar series. So we have a, a really, I think a really, really great webinar for you today. So I will um, just move on a little bit here and, and spend uh, a couple of minutes just quickly highlighting the Canola Council uh, for you. So my name is Brittany Dick. I work with the Canola Council. My role is Senior Manager of Canola Utilization. Um, and so I work quite a bit uh, with our research program that we have at the council. And um, one, of the, one of the priorities of the industry is really research. And so I just wanted to, to highlight that. Uh, the industry has put forward significant dollars to research institutions uh, here in North America to really help us understand how we can um, meal, how it's used in dairy rations, and the research that has uh, been done over the last, um, I would say, five to ten years has really highlighted the value that canola meal has in dairy diets and just how those nutrients are used by the cow um, and really some, some very interesting production benefits uh, that we have uh, observed. And so today during the webinar and the future webinars that are upcoming, um, I, I really hope that uh, you find information that you can take back to, to your learnings and apply in, uh, in your position. So to, to give you uh, a better understanding of the Canola Council of Canada, so I'll just move on to show you um, how that looks. So we have really a full value chain organization at the council, and that represents canola growers, so the farmers that are getting ready here to uh, start getting out on fields or eagerly waiting here in Canada for all that snow to melt to get back out there. We've got our life science companies that uh, are continuously working on developing new varieties of canola that are higher yielding, um, improvements in quality that uh, are really striving to help the industry meet its goals for growth. We have canola exporters, so they're exporting canola seed to countries around the world where that seed is processed. And then we have our domestic processing industry in Canada uh, that is crushing canola seed into oil and meal and allowing um, that, uh, that canola meal and oil to, to go to customers around the world. I've just had a comment here that maybe my voice isn't so clear. Marianne, if you could maybe, am I, am I coming through clear? I, Brittany, so I think it depends on whether you're talking away or towards the computer, because sometimes it's better some, some than others. Okay. Um, that okay. is good. That's better now. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I, I'm sorry about that. So so just to highlight, the canola industry in Canada is really a unified group that um, is, is really working towards uh, improving um, product quality and, and yield of crop. Uh, and it, it's really quite a, an exciting organization to be, uh, to be part of. So Marion, if you could advance to the next slide here, just very quickly, I will uh, just demonstrate that the industry is really geared up to, to grow. And so you can see here in the last several years that the canola crop coming off of the fields averages somewhere around that 19 million metric tons. 
and the industry is set to move to 26 million metric tons by the year 2025. And so I just wanted to bring that to this group's attention here today so that you, uh, you know that the industry is really growing and is very well situated to, um, to supply canola meal to the dairy industry here in North America and to others. Okay, so now getting to the meat and potatoes of our um, webinar here today. If you'll just allow me a, a couple of minutes, I will introduce our speakers. So today we have Dr. Essie Evans and Daniel Scothorn. And so Dr. Essie Evans will be uh, moderating a bit of an interview with Daniel. So Daniel, to, to highlight Daniel, uh, you may know Daniel as the face of dairy management on LinkedIn. He's an avid contributor of everyday learning to dairy managers around the world. Through traveling the world to visit dairy farms, working as a feed mill nutritionist, working on research groups and being raised as an entrepreneurial thinker on a Canadian dairy farm, Daniel brings a vast wealth of knowledge to dairy managers in Canada and abroad. Along with Heather, Daniel operates Scothorn Nutrition, his obsession in coaching dairy managers who want to excel in the areas of cow health, feed cost, and sustainability. He maintains monthly one-on-one -on -one client relationships and works on project-based engagement for various sizes of dairy operators. Some of the countries Daniel has worked in include Canada, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Kenya. And since 2010, Daniel has also worked to develop fat-based energy supplements, Enervive and Energizer that are widely used in Canada. He has completed two degrees in animal science at Dalhousie University and the University of Saskatchewan, working with FeedRight, Federated Co-op, and AgriPoint before starting his own company in 2007. Cooking, skiing, and surfing are what Daniel loves to do, but his greatest passion is spending time with his wife, Heather, and children, Logan, Alexa, and Zara at home in Nova Scotia. So welcome, Daniel. And also to, to highlight Dr. Evans. Thank you. I had uh, the pleasure to work with here over the last several years. And, and to say that Dr. Evans has been a very key part of much of the research that has come out on canola meal um, she, she reviews it, she understands it, uh, she provides insight, she's been invaluable to that effort. So Dr. Evans grew up in Baltimore County, Maryland. She earned her bachelor's degree in agriculture from the University of Maryland, moved to Ontario, Canada, and attended the University of Guelph, obtaining her master's and PhD in animal nutrition. Essie began her career in industry when she joined the research and development group of Canada Packers, now Maple Leaf Foods. One of her areas of specialization was mathematical, is mathematical modeling, and she has led development of models for dairy, beef, swine, and poultry. She's worked with pharmaceutical groups to develop a variety of animal health products as well. She has achieved the level of vice president and managing director of SureGain, the feed division of Maple Leaf Foods, while continuing on her research endeavors. In 2002, Essie started her own company, Technical Advisory Services, and this company provides technical managerial support assists with research and product development to entities requesting such services. And she has enjoyed working with the Canola Council since 2014, um, and, and certainly I would echo the same. So now I will uh, have Daniel take over the reins of the webinar here, and, uh, and I hope you um, enjoy what is to come. So take it away. Hey, can everybody hear me? Yes. All right, excellent. Okay, good morning, everybody. I, uh, I understand it's evening and early morning, late night to many other people that are in this, in this audience today. So I appreciate um, everybody joining. I see that we, uh, it looks like we've reached our limit on, on uh, seats or on, on uh, people available to join, but I think Marianne's actually working in the background right now to actually uh, let more people join. So uh, we're get going. Um, and Daniel, uh, yes. <laughs> Hi, Daniel. Sorry to interrupt. Um, yes, if any of you have colleagues that are trying to get in, I am trying to coordinate with our webinar tenant to get the additional seats that we requested yesterday, and they said it was all going to be there. Um, and Daniel, anytime you want, you can take over and share instead. I will stop sharing, so the screen's going to go blank for a minute, okay? 
So if you go to the um, read view, excellent. All right, I'm going to be quiet and everybody go. <laughs> All right, Essie. Okay. Um, thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. I mean, this is quite an opportunity for all of us, I think. Um, you know, a lot of people have wanted to get to know you a little bit better, and I think this provides just a great platform for that. Um, the first question, you know, when Brittany introduced you, she mentioned some of the feed companies that you had worked for. Um, we were wondering why you started uh, your company, because you were getting a good paycheck, you had a family, and you give that up to just start a company out on your own. It must have been a bit frightening. Yeah, it seems pretty crazy, doesn't it, Essie? <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and it's, it's been nothing but, but pleasure, to be honest. Um, I always joke that I, th I think I had to start my own company because uh, nobody actually uh, wanted to hire me so, or work with me, so I had no choice. Um, joking aside, I, uh, I also, uh, like to, you know, reach out to, to seniors, I guess, when, when I'm in a time of, uh, wanting to, to sort of, you know, like navigate and get some ideas on what, what's the best way forward. So I met this, this uh, old guy, or pardon me, I shouldn't say old guy, should I, sh I should say uh, wise guy wise man. And uh, I said, how did you, how did you do so well on your business? He was in the feed business uh, through his career and uh, he operated a feed mill and, um, and he was just a great guy, wealthy, um, generous, uh, philanthropic. Uh, he was always volunteering and stuff like that. So all the, all the good attributes. And he, um, he said, well, uh, as he scratched his chin, I went many, many years ago. I, um, I was very poor. I was a very poor man. I only had five cents to my name. And I decided to buy a bushel of whole barley with that five cents. And then I took that bushel of barley and I spent the entire day grinding it with my uh, little mortar and pestle. Uh, and then I sold it later that day for 10 cents to a chicken farmer. And then I did the same thing the next day. So I took that 10 cents and bought two bushels the next day. And on and on and on. So my money started to multiply every day. Eventually, I uh, bought a grist mill. I mechanized. I was able to, to, to sell 200 bags of ground barley every day that way. I got married. Uh, and eventually, we started a feed company. I built a mixer, bins, uh, elevator, uh, trans, transport, logistics, the whole works. And, um, but I really didn't make my money until my wife's uh, father passed away and we inherited his estate. <laughs> so, so the moral of the story is to, um, to get a, uh, whether you're a guy or a girl to, uh, to, to maybe, um, go and find a, uh, a wealthy, uh, mate. So there's a, uh, but it's been nothing but joy. I, sh I should say, um, joking aside that, that entrepreneurship was in, uh, it's it's been in my family i guess you know like um i i came from a farm that was uh, i believe three generations of scawthorns um i grew you know like many many farms in canada and u.s over the past uh, 100 years it grew from just milking one cow up to uh my family farm now in in nova scotia is actually i think about 700 milking and there's and it's just been in my blood i as a kid i sold uh, chickens and and turkeys, I raised them. Uh, I actually uh, remember um, bore my dad's pickup truck to start a, a lawn mowing and landscaping business. And uh, it's been, it's just been something I always wanted to do. Um, Essie. So after, after I worked, uh, I, I went to college in uh, Nova Scotia and got a, and received a bachelor of science. And then I went to Saskatchewan for my graduate studies to the University of Saskatchewan under David Christensen, who you know, Essie. Yeah. And um, had an excellent experience there. I had a chance to work with uh, some of the 
some of the high production dairy farms in Saskatchewan at that time, which 20 years ago would, would have been about 40 kgs would be the highest producer at that time. And I got a lot of good experience just working on farms. I, I was employed by the college research farm at one point. And uh, I, worked, I went to work for a few different feed companies after that. And then I moved back to Nova Scotia uh, in, I believe it was the year 2000. And I worked for a short time as a consultant for a company known now as Perennia, who, do, who provide uh, consulting and um, I guess uh, in all realms of agriculture. And I decided at that point, after talking to my, to my wife's uh, father, that um, he said, why aren't you in business uh, on your own? I mean, it's, it makes sense. You just, you're, now's a good time. So uh, with the support of my wife, uh, Heather, I, um, I, got, uh, I got into nutrition consulting. And actually, I'll dedicate this talk to, to my family, my wife. Um, they, uh, especially at this time, when there's, a, uh, when there's so much going on in the world, um, it's, it's really nice to have that family support uh, there for you. So I'll dedicate the talk today to, uh, to Heather. Um, Essie, to, to further answer your question though, it was, um, we, we saw a, gr a good opportunity uh, 20 years ago to, to, to help farmers feed what they can produce in Canada, as, as many of you know, but there is some many on this webinar today that are non-Canadian. Most of our dairy farmers uh, grow their, their own forages, and many of them grow their own grains as well. Corn, barley, wheat, uh, some of them grow soybeans and canola. And many of them, uh, you know, they, they, have, they have a lot of cropping investment. And my goal in, from the onset was to help them realize how to utilize that, that uh, that unique attribute of, of growing crops and to show them what crops they could grow to feed their cattle uh, nutritionally. So that was one of my greatest motivators is just to help farmers grow more of the nutrients on a farm and buy, buy local corn and wheat and soy products and canola products. Uh, so I saw a huge opportunity as well, Essie, to, to find, to, uh, to use byproducts that, that were available in the region at that time. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I guess we're, we're somewhat curious about some of the challenges that you had. Um, you know, when, when we see some of your, your postings on LinkedIn, you know, everything just seems to be going tickety-boo and smooth, and um, you just seem to be having a lot of fun. And you offer some really great advice to, to other consultants, and, and I know the industry is really uh, pleased and supportive of, of what you're doing, but I know uh, I'm sure you have some pretty, pretty uh, challenging aspects to your consulting practice. And what do you see as the major challenges when dealing with uh, feed companies, your clients, and that kind of thing? Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 there's a lot of challenges, Essie. I, I, I guess if if we want to focus on that that for a moment, it's it's a. Uh, um, I guess uh, it's lonely, um, you know, and this, this slide demonstrates that well, when you're at a party, nobody wants to talk about cows. Um, when you're, when you start off in business, uh, you usually it's, it's yourself. Um, so the first, the first thing that you notice is that, yeah, it's, it's, you're, you're on your own, uh, especially doing, especially in our company where we started to do independent nutrition consulting, uh, I think 15 years ago, uh, it was a very lonely field. Um, however, um, part of that was also because we live in the extreme east coast of Canada as well. So we're a little bit away from the, from the, uh, the, the, the more dense areas of Canada and the United States where there's many more dairy farms. Uh, but we found a niche out here in the east coast. And uh, so that was one of the challenges. Um, I guess uh, I, I also want to say that that it's at this point, uh, 15 years later, after starting uh, SN, we, we have a team. Um, we have Amber Craswell and PEI, uh, who's, who's also a dairy farmer. And um, she's been with her company for, I think, three years now. And 
she's been excellent. Uh, she's she's uh, lifted a lot of heavy weight. Uh, and also we have um, Christina uh, Koff Kuglin. She's in our office. We call her the office ninja. She's amazing. Uh, she looks after a lot of her logistics and her and her fat supplement business, and uh, just day to day running of the office. And then of course we have Heather Angel, and she's my my wife and my business partner as well. So between the four of us, uh, we run it. We I'm really happy with what we've uh, created, but we certainly have a lot of challenges. That's that's for sure. But more, I think I believe that more of the um, uh, there's more good things than challenges. Um, I think number one is that. Cows don't listen, all right? It's, it's, and I, I know I've posted about this numerous times on LinkedIn, and I think we have a big LinkedIn audience here today, that um, one of the biggest uh, issues, I think, um, is that we, we, gotta, we gotta get that formulated diet uh, into that cow's mouth and digest it the way that the model, uh, not the way the model predicts, but digest it efficiently. So I think that's, that's one of the challenges. The other thing that's probably more so, and this is getting away from the, the applied nutrition and on to the, to the people side and the human side of this, of consulting and coaching and advising, is that we have a, um, we have, we're all human. Um, so at a, at a professional level and as a coach uh, to these dairy managers, um, we have to have very effective communication um, in order to help a dairy producer uh, or manager or even a, a, a staff person on one of these, one of these farms. Uh, we have to understand their side of things. We have to have a really good understanding as to what, what they're thinking, what they feel the limitations are. Um, these people are very busy. I mean, you know, God bless. They're, they have, these are super entrepreneurs, these dairymen and women, and they have a lot of things on their mind, especially over the past two weeks, right, Essie? And oh. they, so I think one of the, one of the biggest challenges is just to, just to try to get into a, a, a level of communication with that dairy manager where um, we can, we can be effective in our uh, coaching and advising. Now, the coaching would be as important as the, the formulation, would you say? Hmm. I, you know what? It's, I, I would love to, to hear by chat what people think as far as a percentage goes to whether if you're an effective coach or consultant, whatever you want to call it, I'll just use the word coach today. Um, you know, do you, you know, I, I certainly believe that it's a greater percentage uh, communication and, and coaching than the actual applied nutrition. Uh, now, you can obviously do a lot of good for a dairy farm if you can't put a good diet together um, or help troubleshoot health and nutrition issues on a dairy farm. However, on the other hand, um, you know, it's, it's, it's super important to be able to communicate that and get into that level of communication, trust, and rapport with that dairy manager that it takes to uh, to have to be a believable person mm -hmm. uh, on that farm. So, um, so here's a here's a common example, Essie. Um, you you step onto a farm and and maybe it's a producer that that you don't know that well, and and you ask like what's what's important to you or what is uh, what's a what is your goal? I, I should say, let me rephrase that. You ask the, the, uh, the dairy manager, what is your goal? Um, so the, one of the sort of proverbial answers that I would, you know, that you may hear, I think, I don't think I'm alone. I think that people, other people may hear this too, is that, well, I want 40 kgs of milk average and I want to lower my feed cost. Um, so that's, that's a, uh, that might be a very common thing that, that I've, I've heard over the years and I, I think maybe uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a common sort of uh, goal or, or uh, direction to strive. However, um, well, that's easy as a coach. Um, all you have to do is call the bottom 10 to 15% of your herd. And you know what? That's going to increase your average production to 40 kgs. And it's also going to lower your feed cost. Okay. 
So clearly that is not a good way forward, right? I mean, you know, if you call the bottom 10 to 15% of your herd, that may be five to 10% of your milk production. So it clearly doesn't make sense. So it's, it's a matter of, of getting clear with the producer. It's like taking an onion and peeling back the layers to try to understand why what is really important to that producer and, and why. So why is 40 kgs important to you, John? Uh, why not 38? Why not 42? Uh, so, so John may answer, well, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it looks like I, I think our herd is capable of 40 kgs. You might, might hear an answer like that. Um, but, but continuing to peel back uh, the layers, like why do you think your herd is capable of 40 kgs? Uh, if you're only at 35 now, uh, of course, that sounds a little bit demeaning talking like that. But just the point is, that I'm trying to make is just to continue, continually peel the layers back of that onion to try to get a really good understanding as to what that farmer dairy manager is looking for. Um, I have one more point, Essie, uh, to, make, to make on this, if it's all right. Um, Go for it. I, I think one of the other... One of the other challenges is just um, is being being able to help change on a farm, being that I think an effective coach is one that that helps to motivate change. Um, if there is no change, uh, it's impossible for there to be improvement. Um, now, a lot of changes are are maybe potentially going to take that producer or even myself as a as an advisor out of my comfort zone. I may not uh, be comfortable doing something uh, or the producer may not be comfortable doing something because it might be costing an extra thousand dollars a day or $50 a day, depending on what you're, what you're trying to, uh, to help that producer change. Um, so I, I think that's, that is one of the biggest challenges as an entrepreneur is having the, is, um, and as a coach, it's just to, uh, to focus on, on motivating change. So I think as a, so that's, I think, some of my, my business uh, uh, coaching challenges. I think from a, from a personal, if I can get a little bit personal here, I think some of the challenges I think as a person I have is like many entrepreneurs, um, and I'm, I'm sure I'm, most of the people I'm speaking to today are, are business people. So you, you probably know what I'm going to say here, but it's, um, it's difficult to say no to every opportunity that arises. And it's, it continues to be one of my own personal greatest challenges. I'm like a dog at the window looking at birds fly by and squirrels in the woods, right? Um, it starts in the morning. I, I open up LinkedIn. Uh, if, I'm, if, I have a, if, if, I have, if I don't have the discipline to hold off, I open up LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, uh, email, um, and everything that you read is an opportunity. Every message you get is an opportunity. So it's it's a, uh, it's very challenging to, to get yourself into that frame of mind where you're saying no to about 90% of things and yes to that sort of five to 10% of things that really matter. So, yeah. Great. Okay. I guess just pursuing that a little bit more, you've gone through and you've provided your, your coaching, you've motivated your clients. They trust you, um, you know, having worked with you for a bit of time. Um, they're compliant with what you've advised, but does it become increasingly more difficult to bring value? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, Essie. Um, I think there's a few ways, a few things I have to say about this. Um, first of all, I think we are fortunate. We have, we have a lot of clients that have been with us for 15 years. Um, which I, I guess you could say we have really good client retention. Uh, you know, that said, we have one or two that, that, that leave every year and we, we, we go out and, and gain one or two or three or four new clients a year. We're a small company. We don't have uh, hundreds of clients. Um, so, so obviously it's sad to see uh, one or two clients go, but it does happen. Um, and it's a, uh, I, I think it's an opportunity I look at I, as much as it really sucks. I really like to look at it as a uh, as a learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it's 
it's a, um, it's a chance to reflect, uh, to ask questions, um, yes. and to get better. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that, uh, we, we are really working on, uh, these methods of, uh, of taking a, a client centered approach, uh, rather than a, uh, a guru or a, a, I should say like a coach centered approach. So what I mean by that is and I, I don't want these words to be, I, my wife told me not to use any big words because, uh, for, first of all, I can't probably pronounce them myself. So, uh, what I mean is that by taking a client centered approach, it's, um, it's the focus is on the client It's having open ears and, uh, an open mind, uh, okay. and listen to what that client says. So I think the, um, now, number one, this takes a lot of time to practice this approach. Um, and it takes a lot of time. You can't just drop into a farm for five minutes and, and really master that client centered, centered approach. Um, we have, uh, one of the posts that I did on LinkedIn about three months or probably maybe even six months ago now uh, was called the, the five questions uh, every dairy advisor should ask their elite clients. Um, except uh, I was reminded by somebody that's probably elite shouldn't be in there. It should be any client, obviously every client's equally important. So every client should, should be uh, considered uh, the same way and ask these questions. So, uh, so when, so in other words, now, and do I practice this all the time? No, I mean, it takes a lot of time. Obviously, if we don't have a lot of time, you just focus on a few of these questions, but the bottom line is uh, to, when you, when you step on a farm is to ask that client, what's important to you today. Uh, you have no idea as a coach or an advisor stepping onto that farm as to what's important today to that farm necessarily. You may have had some texting back and forth, uh, on, on maybe the cows are just low on milk today or we're getting a lot of milk fevers. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, it's, it's important to, to really have a common understanding as to what's important. Um, the second thing is before, the second thing you could say is before I walk through your herd, is there anything I should pay special attention to? And that just goes back to not assuming anything, get the client's perspective. And then the, the third thing we could say is here's my plan today. I'm going to walk through these dry cows, uh, look at their manure, their, their condition, their, uh, their well-being. Um, are you able to set aside 20 minutes to review things at the end of my visit after I walk through these cattle? And that gets a, uh, what that allows is follow-up. Uh, you can share what you see as a, as a coach or consultant. So, and then the, um, the fourth thing we, you could say is the last time we met, you said there were problems with uh, milk fever is this still a challenge lately. Uh, so review in the past is really important because um, honestly, a lot of the things I learned as a coach is based on uh, what hap- is based on what uh, producers go through, uh, what they, um, what they, the experiences they have and a lot can be learned from that. And then the, the fifth thing is, you know, this is, this is one question I think should be, asked quite frequently is let's review your current feed cost. Uh, you're spending this much on these additives. You're spending this much on this corn, the halogen corn style is costing this much in your diet. And this is the breakdown on a pie chart as to what your costs look like. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, you hired me to, uh, to, uh, to help you with feed cost reduction in many cases or in, uh, or in mitigation of feed costs and, and, I think a conversation around that is important every time. So I think if you, obviously, um, Essie, uh, you worked in the feed industry for a very long time. I think if you let those visits, those farm calls get um, uh, complacent, then, then there won't be much change. I think if you ask these key questions and keep the client's, uh, client's uh, perspective and focus, then that's how you're going to have a really good relationship for many years, if not decades. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so, so moving on, Daniel, um, you know, we've been asking some questions about your business. And I think what people also would like to know is to get a little bit more information on, on your approach to, to ration balancing and feed formulation. And you recently wrote an article called Decluttering Your Ration. And it was sort of about 180 degrees 
different than most of the approaches that you see. Can you give your thoughts on this a little bit more? I think that's mm -hmm. worthwhile for everyone to, to know a little bit more about this. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I guess you dug up uh, some of the something I wrote about a year ago uh, by bringing this question up, Essie. Uh, this was so we published this in the milk the milk producer in Canada, and then we also published it in Progressive Dairyman. This is going back a year to uh, to eighteen months ago, and um, I, I don't know the uh, it was it was funny because I then I got an email from um, from Progressive Dairy editors. Uh, uh, this, I believe it was in um, November or December, and they said, "Hey, you, you got the second most read article on um, on Progressive Dairy this year, uh, which which was awesome." <laughs> but really, I don't know if it's the article everybody's looking at or that pretty barn there of jerseys. You can see that that <laughs> awesome greenhouse. This is a, a beautiful dairy uh, that I visited last year uh, in Costa Rica. Uh, near near Cartago and just a beautiful uh, I don't know what it was 300 cow Jersey dairy and just I, one thing I highlight on the post at that time is just look at those clean water bowls you can't see on this photo obviously but it was a um, uh, so it was it was a it was a well-read article uh, but again I don't know if they're really reading it I think they're looking at the photograph and but it's but what that that article got me thinking. Um, I, one night I was with Heather and I think after the kids went to bed and uh, we, we had it on, we had Netflix on and we were uh, watching one of those home organization shows, right? Like just, you know, here's how to declutter your house. So the thought came to me that, that this is like something I really see common uh, over my career in the, in the nutrition industry as well. Um, now, maybe it's because I don't have the, 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 um, the smarts of other nutritionists and I can't think to that decimal level uh, when it comes to formulation or, or maybe, you know, I, I thought that maybe I am missing something. Maybe there is a, a reason to have six protein ingredients in a supplement or a dairy ration, but maybe not. Maybe it doesn't have to be that complex. Uh, so, um, I wrote an article and, and it highlighted these five points, um, remove, removing redundant protein ingredients. So, and I, I, I think I have enough experience now over the past 20 years to say that I've seen herds excel uh, by just having one or two protein ingredients. Now, maybe there's a cost advantage to have that third or fourth protein ingredient, uh, but I don't know if... Um, in, in a lot of cases, if that's uh, correct to say, yes, maybe we can formulate the RDP perfectly uh, and the lysine methionine just right if we have that six protein ingredient. Uh, but really, are we going to see the return on investment? Um, the second thing was uh, just to use one supplemental source of starch. Um, many, many dairies around the world, with the exception of the, of the deserts of, um, of the UAE or uh, uh, wherever there's no irrigation, they, every, everybody else has corn silage generally. So that's, bingo, that's one source of starch right there. Um, now, how many more sources of starch do we need or will a cow really benefit from? Well, 20 years ago, I used to hear nutritionists say, oh, you know, cows got to have two sources of starch, dry starch, you know, and this is how we optimize the ratio of, of starch to protein. And this is how we synchronize, I'm using air quotes, synchronize everything. Uh, but, but we've seen successes with just one uh, additional source of starch beyond corn silage. Also taken into account that many of our forages are loaded with other forms of, of NFC or non-forage carbohydrates. Like we've got lots of pectins and alfalfa. Uh, soy hulls have copious amounts of soluble fiber. Uh, silage acids themselves. I mean, they're all, they're all contributing to NFC. So but so probably just one source of supplemental starch does it most of the time, unless you have logistic uh, issues and it's, it's better to have two sources just for security reasons. Um, the third thing I noticed, and, and this is, this is um, 20 years ago when I was practicing nutrition in Western Canada, uh, it was quite common to feed chopped straw to, uh, to backgrounding diets for beef cattle or feedlot cattle 
for finishing. Um, and then it cre crept into the dairy industry and it sort of, it sort of, um, so now at this point, or especially five years ago, ago, I should say is that every, almost every farm in, in Canada at a certain point was feeding straw to some group of, of cattle. Um, and you know, is it necessary? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Maybe it is. Maybe there's a shortage of effective fiber on some of these farms and it really pays. But a lot of times uh, the, the straw can be uh, swapped out for just uh, a higher fiber alfalfa or a, uh, a, a, you know, a, a grass, letting a grass mature to 45 to 50 days rather than cutting it at 28 days. And, the, um, and then a the fourth thing is uh, like dropping the nice to haves. And this is a, a term I, I think I might have stole from Mike Hutchins. I think this might be one of his uh, terms, the, the, the nice to haves. And uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe somebody else came up with it. I don't know. It wasn't me though. And it's, those are those ingredients that sort of are, are in there. Many times they're additives. Um, you know, like maybe a farm will have two different types of yeast or three different toxin binders or something like that, or just um, definitely not uh, trying to attack a yeast or toxin binder companies here, but just uh, maybe there's a point where there is uh, redundancies. And then uh, the fifth thing, fifth thing I wrote about in that article was dropping these antagonistic feeds. So um, many times you go to a farm uh, and you'd see the use of straw, for example, in the, in the lactating diet. And of course, the number one reason why people feed straw is for rumen health or their butter fat uh, percentage, percentage is low, uh, or they're just out of forage and have no choice but to feed chopped straw. But that would be not as common as, to, as the other two things. So they may have, uh, at the same time, they may be feeding like a, a high oil corn distiller grains. And so in other words, you know, is it is really is your butterfat depression a result of the of the lack of straw in the diet, or is it the the uh, the fact that um, or or maybe you're not feeding enough palmitic acid? Maybe you got to up it from 300 grams to 500 grams to get the fat up. No, I think a lot of times maybe it's just the fact that we have some antagonists in there, like maybe too much uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids from from distillers greens, maybe we have a, a high oil content pressed soybean meal, like an expeller meal that was done on farm and we're, we're trying to just push too much of that to our cows. There could be many, many reasons. Um, Essie, there's, those are the five things I wrote about in that article. And, uh, and to, to conclude on that point, it's, I, I've, seen, I've seen diets with 30 to 40 ingredients. Um, but we have to remember that cows evolved on three feeds, uh, and that, that was grass, dirt, and water. Okay. So how many ingredients do we need? And, uh, and one more point, um, I also realized, uh, is that are, are we, is perfect necessary when it comes to diet formulation or is is it acceptable be acceptable to be 90 percent right in a diet uh, because that extra 10 percent that we're trying to achieve to get to perfection on a formulated diet is going to cost a lot of money and then the law of diminishing returns really comes into play at that point so okay thank you i saw some comments come up during your you know your discussion of that article and and Again, I, get, I think that a lot of people learn from that and we really appreciate it. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, do you wanna, do we, should we, shall we take a moment to look at some of these comments or it's, I, I didn't see uh, them actually come up. Uh, it was on, on the chat, so it, it just basically. Yeah, Daniel, if you want me to, um, to ask some questions now, I can do that or we could wait until the end of the webinar. Yeah. Yeah, this, is, well, this is totally fluid, so we can do whatever anyone wants. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, okay. So there's, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of neat little comments there. Um, and uh, yeah, we can, we can touch on, uh, on some of these points now. I like your point, Marianne. It's the jerseys. They <laughs> rock. Yeah. 
I have, I'm sorry. I have jerseys. I'm, I'm very, very biased and I don't ever hide it. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like Cristiano. That's, that's a very nice uh, compliment too. I appreciate that. That's my favorite article. Um, yeah. Um, and so just so everyone knows the, the comments are only coming to the panelists. Um, so um, Cristiano says it's her favorite article or his favorite article and he agrees with you. I do have a question. Shall I ask that now while we're taking a little bit of a break? Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been trying to get more people on. I've shared my team viewer ID. So, <laughs> um, so far no one has managed to, to join us, but um, where, where we thought we took preemptive action to make it so we could have more people join and it apparently didn't go through. So I apologize to your colleagues because if you can hear this, you obviously got in um, pays to be on time. Um, <laughs> as the, um, so I'll read this one. Um, as a dairy inspector specialist, milk quality is a big part of his job in compliance in extension capacity with concerns over palm oil and fat additives in dairy nutrition. He wonders how much is being done to study the effects on milk quality, for example, composition quality and including flavor. If something is off, it will be the producer who has the milk refused. Abnormal milk can be rejected. A good example is, um, sorry, I scold and lost it. A good example is in um, opposite effect, vitamin E deficiency will cause oxidation in raw milk. When this happens, the milk is refused until it's corrected just wondering if raw milk quality is considered or are one of the studies being or are studies being done and i'll i'll sort of second that we as producers don't necessarily know why consumers aren't drinking our milk and is it perhaps because it tastes off hmm. yeah that's a that's a good question scott i i can't answer all those things that you ask i, I just don't know all the answers to that question um, I'll, I'll address uh, the, um, the, the, the palm oil question. I mean, in our, our company, we represent palm oil. We represent Enervive and Energizer. Um, so it's, so I'm, I'm well aware of the use of them and stuff like that. And there's many farms feeding a pound or half a pound a cow a day. And it's, and it's a tool. They use it as a tool to increase butterfat percent and then profitability. So it's, now, the, the question on milk quality, I mean, I think those questions are being asked uh, and, and the research end at, at present, like what impact does it have on composition, uh, what, what uh, in quality and in, in, in flavor. So I, some of those are unanswered. I mean, obviously, if, uh, the, when you, when, you know, the cows are what they eat. So, I mean, if they're consuming a, a certain fatty acid, then that milk will tend to have uh, a little more of that type of fatty acid that you feed whether it's a, a palm oil um, or, uh, or a, say an omega-3 fatty acid protected uh, product, calcium salt, for example. Um, I mean, it, yeah, it's certainly gonna have an impact on, on the fatty acid content of the milk. So the question is like, what, you know, is that, you know, what does that infer? Um, you know, is it, is it you know, to, to some people, it, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a concern. To others, they're, they're really happy to be feeding like vegetable-based feed products to dairy cattle and, and they can get away from like the animal-based feeds and things like that, that we, that we traditionally used to feed to cattle to get the calories into them. Um, and then Scott, you say a good example is with, in an opposite effect, vitamin E deficiency, which causes oxidation in raw milk. And yeah, I know your role is, is milk quality in, in the problems in Nova Scotia. So I, I can, um, I can definitely, uh, uh, I definitely know what you're talking about here. I just, we don't have a lot of questions on uh, how it impacts, yeah. how the palm fat affects quality though and stuff like that. So, so um, Daniel, if you, if you want, I will do, a, I'll do a couple more questions or comments and then we'll go back to your talk. And for the people who send in um, questions in the chat window, I don't want to call you out unless you want to be called out. So um, if you want to remain anonymous, how about you just say um, anon or something at the beginning of your question so that I don't, I don't say your name in case that's not what you would like. Um, so to follow up your question you just answered, Daniel, um, the same, the same 
speaker said milk quality is a key. All the additives are great, but the basics you speak of are vital to strong, good quality milk. And remember, this is a dairy inspector specialist speaking. Um, so two, three more others that I'm going to address, and then we'll go back to the presentation. Um, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected your business and farm calls? Oh, wow. Um, ha, you know what? It's evolving every day. Uh, and it's such a, it's such a difficult time for, for, uh, dairy managers and dairy operators, uh, because it's, it's one more, uh, level of, of, uh, instability or, or just, um, risk. And, and so, I, so my, my, my heart goes out to dairy, dairy people because, uh, they've not only, you know, in many regions of the United States and Canada, I mean, they're dealt a, a, a difficult crop year. Um, and then there's obviously hurricanes that, that hit the East coast, uh, from, um, all the way up from Florida to, uh, to Newfoundland and, uh, early frost, late frost, blah, blah, blah. I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's a tough year. So it's, this is just one more thing. What we're doing is we're, um, we decided on Monday that we, we will, um, uh, you know, obviously we're going to abide to all the, 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 uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the suggestions coming from our health authorities uh, and that's to, to practice good, you know, distancing. Um, I laughed at one of the uh, LinkedIn posts that uh, I think it was Cristiano sent to me. Uh, there's social distancing should be one mature cow width length apart uh, from the person <laughs> you're talking to. And uh, if you can't relate to what a mature, a, a, a big Italian uh, Holstein uh, length would look like, then it's equivalent of two uh, baby two uh, baby calves uh, standing uh, length to length. So, um, so I mean, obviously we're going to practice a lot of good, good just sort of biosecurity habits and things like that. So it's, but it, this is definitely evolving and uh, you know, clearly Spain, France, uh, Iran, I mean, you guys are, there's, there's people on a call from those countries and I realize that uh, you guys are, are definitely uh, a few more weeks into it. And, and of course, United States is having a lot of difficulty with it now too. So um, it's evolving. I mean, we don't know what next week will look like. We just hope and pray that, uh, that it will go, that it will quickly uh, go away. So. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Yeah. In the United States, a lot of the places that are heavily affected are not necessarily farm country, but um, still we're very cognizant that it is coming into our area. I don't wanna step on questions that Essie is going to get to. So Essie, you can see the questions are, um, one of those ones that you will be covering, the, I'm looking at the, the, la the middle two of the last three. Can you? Middle two of the last three. Um, so, <laughs> uh, if, if there's something you want to ask that you know that you think is important to the audience, go ahead. And then um, I think from there we'll we'll go on, and, and there'll be lots of opportunity to ask more questions as we go. I think. Yes, yes. I think um, it's it's while it's great to take breaks in the middle and do questions, and it's it's sort of counter to the way I usually do the webinars. Um, it may end up that we get a little derailed in doing questions. So I'll cover these, these last two, and okay. then we'll go on. Um, so let's see, uh, if there are too many ingredients, then it could, this is a question or a comment. Um, if there are too many ingredients, then it clearly adds more pressure on the person feeding the cows and maybe cutting corners. Very good point. Um, and then the last one I'll ask in this, in this period is what recommendations to farmers do you make regarding improvement of home grown feed and decreasing shrinkage of stored feed? Mm. Okay. Yeah. We could have a whole webinar on both of those. Couldn't we? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so those are good questions and comments. And, uh, on the first point there that I think that was just comment, but it, that's, yeah, that's, that's a very relevant point. Um, on the second one on the, uh, the forages, what, what, um, w what can be, so I'm just going to tell you how we do it as, as a coach to our clients, uh, because we, we still see, um, homegrown feeds as being the biggest, uh, contribution to the, uh, to the diet of, of lactating cows in the regions that we work in. And 
it's, and it really makes or breaks um, the success that that, uh, that producer is going to have for the subsequent uh, nine to 10 or 12 months later, that forage quality. Um, so we, uh, every, very frequently, we, we talk about the forage analysis with the, uh, with the producer. Uh, we've used uh, many labs in the past, currently we're using the, the Cumberland Valley. And uh, they've, of course, uh, many people are familiar with Cumberland Valley, it's similar to the Dairy One and Rock River analysis, uh, perhaps, in that we get these 30 hour uh, time points for digestibility, and then we come up with the, uh, the UNDF or the undigested NDF. Uh, so we talk about that, we do a lot of reflection with our clients. Okay, here's how your forage test it. Uh, you did awesome. Look at that dry matter, it's 35.6. Uh, the, the protein on this corn is, is 8.5. That's, that's right on. The starch is 30. Uh, the NDF is 42. The, the, um, 30 hour, uh, digestibility of NDF is, is 70. This is a BMR. He did a really good job. Um, so we do a lot of, uh, we do a, that, that's very integrated in her coaching and, uh, now, the, the other part of that is that we get a lot of questions and feedback from our clients. They want to know how can we lower our purchase feed cost? That's a big word in Canada and U.S. Is how do we reduce our purchase feed cost uh, by growing better and more forages of, uh, that's going to produce a lot of milk and, and ensure healthy cows? So we usually, fo we usually do these things called um, what-if scenarios using uh, AMTS for example, we go through um, maybe perhaps uh, using, uh, let's use an alfalfa grass silage, for example. So we're put on three examples of a grass alfalfa silage that's cut at three different intervals, maybe uh, 28 days, 35 days, and 40 days, for example. And then we're, we're, uh, we're make, we will um, best guess what the NDF and protein would be and the digestibility. And then we can show them the impact uh, through these what if scenarios as to what it would have on purchase feed costs and things like that. So that's one thing we try to do with our customers and clients uh, a lot. And that's usually typically this time of year is when we start to focus on talking about time of cut. And we also talk about what to seed with our clients. Um, we try to be an all, now we're not forage experts or agronomists, but we try to be a little more all inclusive in our, in our work and that we, um, we, we really, and me and Amber both love talking about forages and just, uh, we, we, we just really, both of us really enjoy that aspect of our work, uh, forages and grains. So we do a lot of these what-if scenarios. We talk about new varieties. Um, I'm a huge fan of BMR if you're in a region that can grow it. And that's brown midrib corn for, for folks that are not familiar with that acronym. That's a low lignin, uh, higher NDF digestibility. I'm a, huge fan of that because uh, the key is to improve digestibility of the, f of the uh, fiber in the diet so we can feed them maximum amounts of forage. In most cases, maximum amounts of forages are going to be the most economical way to feed our cows uh, because that reduces the amount of supplemental protein and supplemental starch that we, that we would otherwise need to purchase to formulate that sort of 40 kg dairy ration, right? So that's a, that's just, just a, that's a, that's how I would address that question. Okay, Daniel, let's, um, let's get back to the presentation and move to doing questions at the end. Sure. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, see, they keep popping up here. So I guess a lot of people are listening and interested in what you have to say. Um, I know that of your, of a lot of the posting that you do, one of the areas that you emphasize is feed efficiency. Um, there's a lot of ways of defining feed efficiency. Can you really delve into that a little bit and provide us with a couple of uh, the more important factors in ensuring that we get great feed efficiency? Mm. Mm, yeah, good question again. Um, by the way, I, I, I'm sure everybody's figured out I had these questions uh, in advance, so I had a chance to, uh, to make some slides to go along with them. Yeah, but them. we didn't get the answers in it. Ah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So... Um, uh, and uh, to be honest, I'm pretty last minute with presentations and I didn't even look at the questions that close until last night. Uh, so these, uh, um, so th this is a topic I love. 
Um, unfortunately, I, I can't. The, the Total Dairy uh, uh, Conference in, the, in uh, the UK is cancelled this year. I was going to be presenting information on feed efficiency ratio and how to, uh, how to hack feed efficiency and things like that. So it gives me another year to prep. I'm sure I'll be doing it the night before though. So um, there's, when it comes to, to feed efficiency, what is it? So I, I think many people, there's a few different definitions of feed efficiency out there in our industry. And, and we all, and there's no right or wrong, by the way, it's just, I'm going to explain the way we look at it and let's use, so the way we look at it is we correct the, the production to a 3.5% fat corrected milk. So in other words, that's sort of somewhat correcting for the energy and calorie content of that milk. So we can compare herd to herd a lot easier when we do it that way. Um, other advisors I know uh, use energy corrected milk, which of course would be probably a little bit better to use, but, but we've always been using 3.5. And uh, in the example here, say we take a, a farm that's producing uh, a farm or a pen, uh, for that matter, that's producing 10,000 kgs of milk per day, or 22,000 pounds. And we, uh, we see a butterfat test of 4.2% on average over the past week on that farm. And that's a 250 cow dairy or 250 cow pen, whatever, you, uh, whatever you're basing that on. And the average intake in that pen is 28 kgs. So those are the numbers we start with. And simply we take the uh, the milk and we calculate it on a per cow basis, which is 40 kgs. And then we work it back to a 3.5% uh, fat corrected milk by multiplying. And that 40 kg at 4.2 fat is a 48 kg at a 3.5% fat corrected milk. So this is a good herd, isn't it? Um, get definitely getting more common uh, it, the, these years to see these herds at that production level, but it's, but it obviously it takes a lot of work to get to that level and a lot of things going right. And now if we divide that by 28 kgs, we come up with a feed efficiency ratio of 1.71. And the next slide, uh, I talk about uh, the guidelines for what a, a, uh, an ideal f uh, feed efficiency ratio would be. And these are, this, I believe it was about a year ago or maybe even six months ago, I did a post on LinkedIn and it had a lot of feedback on, uh, on feed efficiency ratio. Um, a lot of really good comments. So I'd, I would encourage uh, folks to, uh, to go back and look at some of that content. Um, you know, I, 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 loved, I love to, uh, to put the time into writing stuff, mainly for the, the uh, fact that you get a lot of, of comments and you learn a lot as a writer. Uh, putting these posts up. And this is one thing that I got some really good feedback on was feed efficiency ratio. Some people disagreed. Um, uh, so I deleted them from my LinkedIn. No, I'm just kidding. Yes. Yeah, there, uh, there are many people were, uh, were uh, reporting uh, feed efficiency ratios that were, were really good, but here's how we classify them. Uh, 1.3 to 1.5. Uh, I would consider low and, so in other words, what this means is that if you have a, if you have a cow that's uh, producing, um, uh, say, 35 kgs, but she's only, and she's consuming uh, 26 kgs of, of uh, feed to do that, then that cow would be considered a low feed efficiency ratio, and she would fall into that 1.3 to 1.5. So that's low. Now, I, I think that in most cases, these are room and health issues. Um, assuming the, uh, the days in milk is in that sort of normal 150 to 180 range. Um, and also assuming that this has a pretty even demographic split where we have uh, about 30% heifers, 30% lactation two and 30% uh, lactation three plus, or I guess we're missing 10%, but the other 10% you could just put in anywhere is there. Um, so making all those assumptions and putting them aside, um, if we still have a pretty good calving interval and we still have a pretty even split of mature and heifers, uh, then we nine times out of 10, it's uh, acidosis or just poor room and health or very poor diet digestibility. So then the question is, well, why is that diet so low in digestibility? 
Is it because we're feeding three kgs of fine chopped straw because we're out of forage? Well, maybe, um, but we're still probably not going to get a feed efficiency ratio that low. Um, if we are feeding um, a low 30 hour NDF digestibility grass or alfalfa, for example, maybe that could contribute to it. But really at the end of the day, it comes down to the bigger things and that is just room and health. And that room and health goes back to not only what's being formulated, but of course, what's being consumed by that cow. Uh, 1.6 would be considered good. Uh, I would, if I had a, if there was a farm running 1.6 and they weren't feeding a high amount of supplemental fat, because supplemental fat will boost the feed efficiency by about 0.1 to 0.15. Uh, so you have to also take that into account, whether or not that farm is feeding a high amount of supplemental uh, fat especially palmitic acid. Uh, so 1.6 could be good. Now the excellent farms I'm seeing out there these days, and this is, this is, and this is a, uh, definitely a, um, something that I've been seeing for the past decade, but 20 years ago, when I looked at this number, I wasn't seeing many that were 1.7 to 1.9, but now I am. Uh, and, and it's, it's not in by any means because we're, making our diets or, or that I am formulating a much better diet. I think the point is that our cows are genetically getting better. They're better converters. They're more efficient cattle. Uh, and the second thing is that we're getting into these, a lot of farms are feeding these high digestibility forages now. And uh, it's, I, I'm seeing a lot of farms now between 1.7 to 1.9. Now, one of the, one of the reasons I like to calculate this number on a farm, if there's problems especially, is because it's, it's a really good troubleshooting tool. Now, if, if a farm is having a lot of uh, pregnancy rate issues or reproduction, reproductive issues, maybe cystic ovary disease, um, many times you go and calculate this feed efficiency ratio and you find that it's actually uh, abnormally high. Um, and that goes back to the fact that many vets would agree that um, cystic ovaries come about from a low energy diet. Uh, so it may not be low energy, it may be just the fact that the cows aren't eating enough and uh, they're in a, a huge energy gap. Um, usually, typically you see farms with low body condition score with these high, high feed efficiency ratios. And it may be as high as 2.1 or 2.2 in some cases. And uh, the other thing to pay special attention to is, uh, again, just the body condition, the rumen health and the, uh, the overall dry matter intake. So there's nothing wrong with the two for a feed efficiency ratio if they have good condition, good reproduction, and a really good dry matter intake. And if those cows look excellent, then there's nothing wrong with the 2.0, but it may, uh, it may indicate problems, so. Great, thank you. I think you can, you can sort of tell, Daniel, that I'm trying to drill down a little bit deeper. You know, we started uh, looking at, at sort of rations in general. Um, now we'll talk a little bit more about balancing the rations. And what sure. do you see as, as the more difficult components of ration balancing? Hmm. This, is where, this is where the questions get hard too, Essie. Yes. Um, but we can't avoid them. No, can't skip. There we, I'm in control here. Right? I can just go to question yes. eight here, right? Okay, that's fine. So. <laughs> no. um, yeah, what are the most difficult components of ration balance? And, and you know what? I, I think it's, I think I, I'm not alone. I believe that, that any, any nutritionist on this webinar or, or that listens to this webinar later uh, can, it's probably pretty confident that they can take AMTS and formulate a, a 45 kg diet, 45 kgs of milk and 4% butter fat. Um, and, and, you know, all you need is, is these feeds at these levels. And uh, I, I think most people would agree that it's, that it is possible on the computer to formulate that diet. Uh, so I don't, I don't regard the applied nutrition part of, um, of ration balancing to be the most, the biggest challenge. Okay. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll preface it by saying that obviously if we have weak, uh, if, if the, if the producer was dealt a, a difficult year for weather and, and it was challenging to cut at the right time, 
uh, or they, the starch level in a corn silage was low or something like that. I mean, those are things that, that, are, that are just unfortunately dealt out on years like this. Yeah. And yeah, um, yeah. so okay. I, what I, here's the biggest challenge uh, in ration formulation. It's taken this computer program um, this diet that's uh, supposedly um, a, a 42 kg diet and, and making that happen on farm. Um, mm -hmm. So in order to get that 42 kgs, they get, a, they get to consume 26.6 kgs of dry matter intake. And uh, the, the biggest challenge uh, still is um, trying to have that cow consume well, first of all, it's, it begins with the feeder. Is, is having that feeder um, trained and uh, given the right tools. Uh, and one of those tools is one of the, uh, as one of the people in chat said, uh, too many ingredients uh, becomes a, a challenge for a feeder. So given that feeder the right tools and training uh, to do a good job, because they want to do a good job. They want to do an excellent job because uh, it's their place of work. So by giving them the right uh, tools and, and training. Um, and then uh, the other thing that goes into this uh, accurate ration is, is clearly um, forage analysis, having uh, frequent and strategic uh, forage analysis and uh, implementing those into that AMTS program. And then uh, mixing accuracy and then time of day feeding. There's so many factors that go into the physical part of nutrition um, that it, that it, it definitely uh, far outweighs the, um, the challenges that we have with uh, uh, applied nutrition on a computer, so. Great, okay. Um, I can see we're starting to get some questions about uh, protein and canola meal. So I think the next thing I wanna ask you about is, is balancing for amino acids. Hmm. Um, how strict are you adhering to model requirements? Hmm. Uh, okay, well, it, it depends. It, and uh, I guess we, we look at every one of our clients is unique. Um, and the reason I say that is because everybody has a different idea or goal and a different herd of cattle and a different, uh, a different forage. Uh, we have no clients. It's not like chicken farming where things are kind of similar. Uh, every dairy farmer that we have is unique. Many times it's this, um, and that's what makes a job fun. Everybody's different, right? And we get to deal with a lot of different uh, people and it keeps it very entertaining. Um, so we, we, don't, we, we don't have a one size fits all approach when it comes to uh, formulation of, of these uh, nitrogen um, nutrients. We, we, we certainly have some farms that are using amino acids. And, uh, and to be honest, we're, we're still learning. Um, we, we, we do supplement uh, in many of the, in some of our canola slash uh, protected soy or heat treated soy diets, we do supplement uh, some level of methionine in some of these protected methionine. If there's a few different products we, that we use, and um, but it, at the end of the day, it it's a discussion with that client as to, hey, here's a way to get a little bit more milk protein, which you can sell for X dollars and possibly uh, fetch another uh, one, two, three hundred, four hundred dollars per day on your milk check. But what we need to do is we have to formulate a diet like this and we have to feed these amino acids at this level and assuming they all go right, everything goes right and the, uh, and the forages don't change much and, uh, and our corn is highly digestible and fine ground and our cows are not suffering from rumen acidosis. Here's what these amino acids will probably do. Um, and is this something you want to go ahead with? Uh, now, a lot of times amino acids are, are clearly come with a, some level of sticker shock, right? They're, they're, there's no amino acids that are being given away or cheap. So we have to do a very cautious um, duty for our clients as to, uh, to, to give them a, a, a chance where, where it's, it looks like it might be beneficial. But 
but making a decision uh, very quickly whether or not we're seeing the benefits from them. Now, we, we have situations where we see some benefits. The milk protein might go up. Per, perhaps we have a, a herd that's feeding um, a, an encapsulated methionine and the milk protein seems to be high on that farm. But what are you comparing it to? Are you comparing it to, um, to that farm's uh, previous two weeks of protein? Or are you looking back over years and years of data on that farm and trying to really uh, nail in on what, um, what the protein normally is without amino acids. So we look at each farm on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, the most common ones we feed, like I said, are methionine, and in some cases, lysine. Um, we do, uh, from time to time, uh, look at the, um, the, the lysine in terms of, um, I guess, not... We're, we're always taking a look at the lysine relative to the metabolizable energy of a diet. Uh, we like to see that uh, for optimal production. We like to see that a, a little over, uh, up around 3.0. Um, and that's grams of digestible lysine to the metabolizable energy. We also look at methionine that way too. We like to see that up around 1.1 to really get a milk protein boost. Uh, but I'm going to admit that not all times we see success with these products and it ends up being a, a, a hefty cost for, for clients to, uh, to use. Now, there's more science coming out every, every month uh, that helps us understand this a, a little bit better. But I'll be honest, we don't, we don't use amino acids all the time. Uh, we look at, at amino acids, but the main things we look at are um, on AMTS are uh, Still, we look at crude protein just to make sure it's roughly within a range that it should be. Uh, we look at the rumen ammonia. That's one of my favorite numbers to look at because it's so closely um, uh, related to microbial protein yield and, uh, and also mercury and nitrogen. And those are two things that, that we keep an eye on. And the other thing is uh, we, we look at metabolizable protein. And okay. Uh, many times we, um, we find that diets uh, with canola meal are, um, now we, Essie, I know you're going to talk about uh, the, the specifications to use for a canola meal on AMTS, but many times we do find high levels of success with canola meal diets, uh, even though the metabolizable protein might be 5% lower than the uh, in the metabolizable energy. We see that cow produced usually to what that metabolizable energy is in that diet, even though with, um, uh, with metabolizable protein being slightly lower. So, and then the other opportunity we look at with amino acids, just trying to formulate a lower cost diet. I mean, there's the possibility still, uh, and many people practice this, I know, uh, of feeding some level of amino acid just to allow a, a lower protein diet. So yeah. well, the reason I'm asking how you balance sort of gets into uh, the next question. And I think um, you, you uh, had a LinkedIn post where you showed that you had balanced a diet with 6.5 kilos or sort of 14 pounds of canola meal. And mm -hmm. you were trying to make a, a point. And I know you and I discussed the difference between uh, a nutritionist and a fetist with a nutritionist being someone that that formulates on nutrients. And yet there, there are some people that seem to think that the cows have a requirement for a certain ingredient. So based on how you formulate, you know, when you come up with some of these recommendations that seem to be working, um, is that because of the nutrient profile or because of your bias towards that ingredient? Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, uh, bear with me for a second, I think. Just bear with me one second. I just have to okay. make sure I've got the. Uh... Okay. Do we still? Does everybody still see the PowerPoint slide? Yes. Oh, okay. No way. I can't. Ju -ju -ju. Hi, Daniel. I was on the phone um, with Zoom. How? What's the matter? Oh, I was just. Uh, I. I don't think anything's the matter. I just changed my view here on Zoom, and I. I'm not seeing our. Uh, uh, oh. Um, Okay, it the, says uh, I'm viewing your screen and right now I can see the PowerPoint in the, um, oh golly, whatever it's called, the, the, the mode that is not the reading mode. So is this, yeah. okay. Now I see right. LinkedIn. You see LinkedIn now? There, okay. I did briefly. Yeah. Now I'm back okay. to the slides question. Right. So we're yeah, good. So, so okay. you see question eight. Um, 
yeah, so so I guess uh, Essie, to answer okay. your question. Yeah. yeah, and I'm sorry, while we're unmuted, anybody who has colleagues that wants to join that couldn't join earlier, we've got it opened up to a hundred or to more pant, more room. So tell them to join. Oh, excellent. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this, yeah, the, I, I never heard of the word fetus until I, uh, until I read this question, Essie. Uh, I like that. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a neat word. I, I think that I, I've, been doing, I've been doing rations for uh, 20 years and like at a professional level, right? And one thing I do see is the use of um, sort of that, you look at, it, you look at a ration uh, on a farm, on a farm that you've been invited in to, to visit, maybe just to discuss uh, formulation and, and nutrition. And you look at the ration and it's got, for example, um, 2.0 kgs of canola meal, uh, 1.5 kgs of uh, soybean meal, um, 5.5 kilograms of corn meal. Uh, now, and, and the first thing I think of is, okay, well, these, right or wrong, um, this is a, a diet that's not uh, using the optimizing feature of the, uh, of the formulator of the, no matter what formulator they're using, whether it's uh, AMTS or any of the other, uh, optimizers that are out there. Um, it's, you can tell when you see those whole numbers on feed ingredients that, that it's a diet that's not being, uh, quite as optimized as it could otherwise be. Um, and that difference, I think, is an opportunity to save an extra 10 to 20 cents if you let the computer do some of the work on that optimization. And that's, that's a, uh, I'll say kudos to, to Dr. Alan Vogue. He was my, one of my first mentors in, in ration formulation. Um, he works for a, a feed mixing company now. But he, uh, he taught me the use of optimization, optimizers, and it was in that product uh, called Spartan Dairy, right? Remember that one, Essie? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's still around, will, actually. Of course, it's still around, and, it's, and it, it does continue. To, the, the new version of it continues to be a nice product, but this is going back to the old MS-DOS program. Mm. And uh, when I was in college, I used to play on uh, Spartan Dairy Ration Evaluator uh, for, um, on weekends. Can you believe it? Um, just, it was, nerd. it was always a hobby. And there is, so I learned to use the optimizer at a very young age. And then Dr. Vogue uh, gave me uh, a lot more strategy and, and, and uh, methods of, of getting a, a really uh, well-functioning optimizer. So I still highly, that's one of my things about, one of my favorite things about AMTS is that um, when they came out with that optimizer many years ago, um, I, I clung to it. I, I learned how to use it because it is a different optimizer. Uh, but once you figure it out, once you, once you learn how many constraints uh, the program likes or doesn't like, then, uh, then you, you can start to turn out some pretty nice results. And it's, and the, it's, I just love it because a lot of these nutrients we're formulating for, um, like metabolizable protein, for example, that's a very dynamic ingredient. So to, for a program to come up with a optimizer around, that's great. And there's, now, going back to your question, though, the, the fetus would be one that, that just puts in fixed levels of, of ingredients. Um, but to now, clearly, if the only ingredients you ever have as a dairy manager are corn, soybean meal, cotton seed, uh, heat-treated soy product, uh, alfalfa hay, and corn silage, well, clearly, that's probably all you have to do because it's, there, there may not be any other grains forages or byproducts that you that are worth considering so i think you it's, it's safe to say that you can probably formulate numbers uh, on your own just by by tweaking things up and down uh but but really at the end of the day uh i think 90 percent or or maybe even more of farms in north america are using um a whole plethora of different ingredients when they're looking at the opportunity to to optimize the, the diet cost so that, that and, and to fully recognize the benefits of these uh, ingredients, then we have no choice but to go to a, a nutrient um, formulation and, and lease optimization. Now, to get to that level of trust in a program, 
uh, you really have to be at a point where you're really confident of your forage analysis, your grain uh, nutrient values, um, the, the starch level on everything, the NDF level, those are the two big things, NDF and starch and ash, obviously, and fat. Those are the big nutrients and, and what's going to deem a, a, a formulator um, a, a formulation program to, to predict accurate results. So yeah, I've gone that way uh, many years ago and it's, and it's, uh, and we continue to, so. Okay, thank you. Um, so going back, did, did you wanna make some comments about your 6.5 kilos of, of uh, canola? Yeah, I, I put this post up here. This was back in, uh, back two months ago. Uh, this was a post that was, um, I, 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 I get, I, I've had the opportunity to, to travel and for work and, and also for pleasure. Uh, and every, even though um, I might be on a vacation, I still try to drop into a dairy farm uh, if it's possible. And so I've had the opportunity to, to talk to many dairy managers in many, many parts of the world. And um, these are some of the things that I might hear. Um, we're a high production herd. We don't, we don't, you know, we, we don't, feed canola it's it's not a high production uh, ingredient um in india it's very common to see a, a very high glucosinolate rapeseed and that's easily confused with canola because unfortunately they're using the word canola uh in place of rapeseed meal in many countries and and then in asia it's it's um i i heard uh this this myth that that perhaps uh, canola may cause a, a a lower intake um, than soybean meal and cows actually have like a, they need soy meal. Like there's no other question. And this is, I'm not trying to poop on soybean meal. Um, it's, it's a very nice ingredient. Um, but really as a, as an independent consultant, we have to take the cost into perspective of everything uh, so that the, the dairy manager can come up, can be feeding the most economical diet possible. That's going to give good cow health and production. Right. So I would often have um, here uh, that we can't feed 10% uh, any more than 10% of the diet is canola meal. Um, and I, re I remember going back, thinking back to those days when I used Spartan dairy ration evaluator. Um, do you remember there's a little window uh, that you could open up? I think it was like F3 key or something like that or F2. And it would come up with the, um, with the levels of, maximum and mi maximum levels of ingredients and there was canola meal in there from what i remember it was it was 10 percent maximum of the diet now maybe that's because it spartan dairy ration value was was built 30 years ago and maybe perhaps there was levels of erucic acid and glucosinolate at that time um, that maybe were more of a concern than they, they are now. Now it's not a concern at all on canola meal. Uh, but perhaps that's the one thing. The other thing is that uh, speaking with some of our Chinese um, uh, uh, friends, we noticed that the, uh, their textbooks still have um, a maximum level of canola meal. Of like, I believe it was... I believe uh, it was like one or two kgs of canola meal. And that's in the textbooks that students are still learning from. Um, so these, these sort of mythical um, maximum levels of canola meal are, uh, are you know, we got to question everything. I think that the fact is that we got to look, we got to look ahead and look at why some of these values are put in there. Um, I have definitely found no issues with surpassing 10%. In many cases, uh, I've gone to as high as 20% of the total diet dry matter with canola meal, just because it makes economic sense to meet the MP and the, and the, uh, the protein needs of that cow with that, with that nutrient, canola meal. So I, I, I've grown to be comfortable with these levels. The post that I did here, we, at that time, we happened to be feeding a diet that was 6.5 kgs of canola meal. And I just wanted to bring it to people's attention um, and, and perhaps many people have fed this level of canola meal already before, uh, but, but when you have a pen that's consuming 33 kgs of dry matter intake 
and their, uh, their production is 54 kgs at 4.1% and 3.4% fat um, on a really strong total herd average. Um, really, what's wrong with that level of canola meal? And I think it's just that fear of going into that unknown and, um, and just uh, not listening to what the cows are trying to tell us. Now, yeah. could there be too much sulfur? Uh, hey, perhaps. I mean, we might be getting into a high level of sulfur in those diets. Um, maybe too much of the raw, too much of a good thing is also a potential problem when you feed that level. Um, but there's many things to think about. So, yeah. so okay. Well, well I, I think uh, that's basically what I was asking for the next question as well. And I, I think we've got some questions about that on on canola meal, like. A lot of people, I think the, the optimizers don't work all that well because they're setting a maximum and a minimum level for all these ingredients. And it sounds like you're a bit more open on some of these and uh, not as concerned about an upper and lower limit. Is that the case? Yeah, that is the case. And maybe now is a good time to actually pull up a diet um, in, on EMTS and, and just show you, just show everybody just... Uh, um, yeah, because oh, uh, we're, we're losing some people, but I think we're getting a lot of questions about that. So that would be a good yeah. time to, to get into All that. right. Uh, so I'll pull up this, uh, just an example here. Uh, so this producer graciously uh, allowed me to, um, to share his diet. Does everybody see a screen here called AMTS Cattle Professional? Yes. yes. Okay, excellent. So this is, a, uh, this is a mature cow diet. This is the same farm, uh, Sunny Point Farms. He, I, I, um, he, he graciously offered uh, his diet for this webinar, um, and uh, he uh, he's getting good results. He's he's a he's, he's always sort of in between that forty three to forty seven kgs or liters of uh, of herd average. Uh, definitely a, a very very good manager. There's many things that go right when you get a production level that high. Um, so I'm not going to by any means say it's, it's this diet here that we're formulating for him that's going to be the main reason why he's getting those numbers. There's many other things. Uh, but let's look at this diet for a moment. Um, you can see, first of all, I want to highlight is just the fact that um, this, is a, this, is a fair, this is a mature cow diet, uh, by the way. This is a pen that's consuming 33 uh, kgs of dry matter intake currently uh, this week. And... Um, you can see we, our primary uh, focus on this diet is to maximize the use of, usage of his forages. He has limited amounts of corn silage and he, he does have enough uh, haylage uh, to get through until the new crop. Uh, but the bottom line is we still, like any producer, we still want to try to maximize the use of, of these uh, of for, homegrown forages and homegrown grains. It's tough year cropping in Nova Scotia. We end up getting some pretty high fiber uh, corn silage, um, very low starch in some of the corn silage just because there was a, uh, it was a short growing season and then a hurricane hit. So, we, um, so as a result, the, the forage level in this diet is not all that high, but you got to take into consideration that these are, this is a low starch corn silage and we have some uh, decent amount of ADF and NDF in this uh, second cut haylage alfalfa grass blend. It's a 34 dry matter, 15.6 um, protein. Like I said, we had a, alfalfa did not have a good year uh, as well. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of grass that was planted. So, it, you know, a 35 ADF, uh, quite a bit of fiber in there, 48. Um, when we look at the, uh, the carbohydrate digestibility, the uh, digestible uh, NDF is 56% at 30 hours, uh, which is moderate for a grass alfalfa. Uh, but when we go in and look at this uh, corn silage, uh, we can see that it's uh, obviously very wet. It was an immature crop. Um, and uh, if we go down here and look at the starch, it's only a 14.5 starch. Uh, so yeah, it was a tough year, but here's where this, this forage really shines. Uh, look at these these uh, DNDF levels. This 30 hour of 74.9 percent. So although we saw a lot of forages on the East Coast this year that had low starch corn silage, uh, we saw some really super numbers on uh, NDF digestibility. And I'm I'm 
although there's uh, it's, it's costing a lot for supplemental starch this year. I'm seeing some super production numbers this year on these forages that we kind of were a little bit nervous about last October. So um, now you can see um, I what I do is I put a min and a max on ingredients that he is only has that the producer only has limits limited amounts of so for example the straw is very low in supply and we um and we're actually going to take it out uh, very soon it's only we're actually just taking it out very slowly it's down to 0.2 now and it'll be zero soon and the corn silage we're, we're limited that's all we can feed is 5.2 kgs dry matter um, you can see we're using soy pass as a metabolizable protein source and uh, lots of Canadian canola meal. And we're, uh, you know, we're feeding a palmitic acid called Enervive. It's one of our products at Scotland Nutrition. And corn, grain that's finely milled, barley that's uh, relatively finely milled, and then all the minerals down here and, uh, and a couple of additives. So, we, um, so just to give you a rough idea, we... Um, essentially on most of our diets we're formulate for uh for mp um we will put a cp minimum on on the uh, on the diet to uh if mainly if we are uh, seeing a, a low room in ammonia so for example um uh some of the amts folks uh sam for sam tells me that there there could be issues with going down below 120 for room and ammonia uh, so I try to maintain that and the easiest way to do that is to try to bring in a little bit more CP. You can do it with urea too, of course, but in this case, we're doing it with CP. So, um, so that gives you a rough idea as to how I formulate proteins. Um, as far as carbohydrates go, clearly on this farm, we only have one carbohydrate that we can, other than NDF, there's only one uh, NFC source that we can formulate with and that's starch. So we, uh, but we have a, a, a constraint on the amount of barley. So I let the corn grain go really to where it needs to um, with the formulation. And uh, at, at the present time, we're, tr we're trying to formulate a, a diet that's, or we're successfully feeding a diet that's 26.5 starch. And that's a moving target depending on what we see on the farm during that monthly visit. If we see manure texture uh, become too soft or too loose, and we see a lot of manure scores of two, uh, then we adjust the starch to a level that's uh, that's going to be uh, that's going to allow more NDF in the diet. Uh, vice versa, we also look at PE NDF. Uh, we do, we monitor it. Um, the other number we formulate for is supplemental C16 um, because these are a lot of these farms are being paid on uh, butter fat percent. And then of course all the minerals are formulated. Um, so this gives you a rough idea as to what uh, constraints uh, I'll put on a diet. Um, and then, uh, for example, uh, we could optimize this diet and it's, it should turn out the same way that I originally had it. Yes. So, so what we're seeing is a diet here that's uh, generating a, an ME and an MP of around 53 kgs a cow day, which is very close to what they're achieving right now. I think they're 54 on that pen. Uh, so we know that this model is working correctly. Uh, so, so that gives you a rough idea, um, Essie, as to what, what I, how I use mins and maxis and what, I, what level of, uh, of flexibility I give this program. Uh, to come up with the least cost solution. And you can see there's no ingredients in here that are like uh, whole rounded numbers with the exception of barley and, and corn yeah. silage. These are locked in there, but everything else is floating. Um, so if I want to increase MP, uh, say a little by to try to sneak that up higher than ME, then I'll, I'll just simply uh, see if this works. I never like doing this in front of people because sometimes it doesn't uh, doesn't work for me. In this case, it did. Uh, you can see what it did to get that MP up to 104% or 53.95 kgs of MP allowable milk is just to bring in the uh, a little bit more soy pass and uh, uh, clearly because it's the most in this situation it's. Uh, given the constraints I put on it, that's the, um, the most economical source of metabolism protein in this diet, so. Okay. Yeah. Let's just go back over to the PowerPoint, to the uh, slides here then. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah. So you've just answered that one. Uh, the final question, I think we're in the interest of time. If you can answer that briefly, I guess your major points of what you see uh, is well, how dairying will look in the future and, and what we should all be doing to prepare. Hmm. Well, if you would have asked me three weeks ago, it might have been different <laughs> before uh, this coronavirus uh, crisis. So yeah. I'm sure things will be back to normal at some point. Uh, many of us have been through these, these uh, cycles. So nothing's like this one, of course. There's a lot of lives being lost. But um, all we can do is uh, hope and pray that things will be back to normal. So I, I don't know if the cow of the future will look like this, where we're managing her with such a level of precision that we're measuring every single detail about that cow. Is, it, is that the direction that our, that our industry is going to go when it comes to, uh, to feeding and, uh, and management? I, I, I think that to some level, it will go to higher levels of precision. Um, I don't know where my points are here, but what I, what I meant to have on that slide was that we will have, I, I believe, a high, higher level of precision when it comes to things like environments and sustainability of your industry. I think we get more precise on our fertilizer programs, our spraying programs, and things like that, just because it makes not only uh, environmental sense, but economic sense. Um, now, the, on a cow level diet, I, I, I think that we're clearly we're going to see uh, more uptake of these high digestibility forages. I, I can't uh, stress enough to, to our producer group that, that the key to, to uh, uh, a higher level of profitability is going to be a higher digestible forage. And, and that's the type of thing we'd like to, to help them with. And the, uh, I, and then finally, I, I think I, I'll say that I, I believe that, uh, that AMS and robotic milking will, will be uh, even more common in the future. And it's, I've, I've seen this enough now that um, just a level of cow comfort and um, the ability of that cow to perform her natural uh, activities um, can't be matched uh, with a parlor compared to, a, uh, to a, an, AM, an AMS or robot milking unit. Um, now, that's not saying that parlors and tie stall farms don't currently have um, excellent cow care and well-being. But if there's anything we can do to pull that cow out of a holding area for two to three hours a day, and put her, keep her in her environment that's comfortable and accessible to the feed bunk, um, then I think robot milking is, is going to take us further in that direction. So I think that's, that'll be a... Uh, something we see more of in the future is my prediction. Obviously, I think that's a pretty easy prediction to make. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Well, Daniel, I know that, that everybody is just chomping at the bit to, to ask you some questions. We appreciate the time that you took um, and that you were willing to, to discuss with us. Before we get to the questions, um, I would just like to, to make a, you know, go back on some of what you were talking about with canola meal and, and maybe answer why you're, you're able to use the, the levels that you're using and discuss the nutrient values. Mm. Um, can you advance that for me? Okay, yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, yeah. no, that's okay. I, I figured this would be more, more quick. Um, and basically, I think you and I have discussed this, Daniel, that most of the published values for canola meal are basically wrong. Um, if we look at something like NRC, the NRC publication that was out a million years ago, um, they don't even list solvent canola meal. They have an expeller canola meal. Where the values came from, I don't know. Um, next slide. But what Canola Council has been doing to try to address the issue is that they had a, a four year long study um, involved the 13 crushing plants in Canada. They collected three samples per year from each of those. Those were sent to uh, Bogdan Slominski in, in uh, Manitoba, as well as being sent to um, 
Glenn Broderick at USDA Dairy Forage Center, and they were analyzed for just about everything you could analyze for nutrient-wise and anti-nutrient-wise. And basically what Canola Council did was review these results annually with the crushing plants to see, um, you know, basically which ones might be able to improve how they manipulated the meal to get a, a more consistent product. And we did see that, that we were getting a very, very consistent product. Um, next, please. And what's important for dairy is that we now have generated separate values for solvent and expeller meals. And Daniel, when you and I were talking, you had results from some of the, the forage analysis labs and I've gone back since then and looked at them and they just sort of combine all canolas together. So if we're looking at, at their library values, they're not gonna be very accurate and you need to know whether you've got solvent or expeller meals. Mm -hmm. And I think this survey allowed us to do that. We concentrated on nutrients required for the different platforms, the NRC platforms, as well as the CNCPS type platforms. So we supplied samples, as well as the listing of the nutrient values to Cornell. Um, Debbie, did, Debbie Ross did analysis to determine the, the different protein fractions. And from there, we got some really good values that were issued out of Cornell. I think um, if you just move on to the next here. Yeah, this is a, an AMPS screenshot. I wasn't as bold as you because mine for sure would have screwed up if I was <laughs> to try to uh, generate values. But you can see that they do have a uh, canola meal solvent, canola meal expeller with values that, that are trustworthy and, uh, you know, provide a nutrient profile that I think that you can use with the level of confidence that Daniel is using when he formulates diets. Um, a couple things to, to look at. We want to make sure that, you know, you saw some of his screen slides there where he looked at the, the carbohydrate B3 fraction. Um, we went to a lot of work to try to generate the correct values. If you could move to the next, there we go. Um, we had all the samples analyzed to determine the, the, the different time points. Um, the potential digestibility went out to 240 hours. So all that work has been done, and I think we can, we can look at these values with some confidence. So after you've double-checked that, I always go back and make sure, yep, that's the value that was in there. When we look at, at right here, we can see that that's what just came up on the chart. Um, and the next thing to, to check for in some of the programs, um, if you can motor forward, to make sure that the protein B2 values aren't changed. Now they stay true in AMTS, but in some of the, the other software programs uh, to remain unnamed, these values become the same as, as the carbohydrate uh, fiber fraction. So that becomes, you know, goes from being uh, two something to becoming seven something and and that'll really goof you up so there's a little button that you click in some of those programs so just make sure that the the protein b2 stays with what cornell has prescribed and what we have determined from our analysis and if you need uh results basically for for other platforms that you know might not be covered or whatever um those are available on the Canola Amazing website right here. So thank you. Here we go, okay. Canola Amazing feed card. Yes, yeah, so Essie, thank you very much. I am gonna change screen view. Everybody has been fantastic. I apologize profusely for the confusion at the beginning. We thought we had um, more than enough room and as I was worried, we had a lot of people join. Um, we have a lot of questions in the chat window and we have a lot of questions in the Q&A window. So we'll get right to that. 
if you want more information or to reach out to the Canola Amazing people at the Canola Council of Canada, go to the website canolamazing.com and also check the hyperlink for feed guide to get an updated copy of the dairy feed guide. And again, we want to make sure that you know about our other webinar series. For some of you that are not acquainted with AMTS and the nutritionist, we do educational webinars every um, every month. It's usually the second Thursday of the month and we do it twice. Once at nine o'clock in the morning Eastern time and once at six o'clock in the evening Eastern time. We take live questions at the end. Our upcoming webinar in April is going to be Frank Mittler from University of California, Davis, and he's going to be talking about his topic is actually 2050, how we can feed the planet without losing it. So that will be a really interesting one to attend if if we ever get out of um, isolation and quarantine and start start seeing people and feeding people, um, we're going to need to f- need to feed, I hope, a lot of people. We have some upcoming Canola Amazing webinars, and they are going to be on April 28th, same time, 9 a.m. Eastern time. That will be with Dr. Antonio Fasciola from the University of Florida. We will have um, Dr. Kenneth Kalsher joining us. The June 2nd day is tentative. He has been extremely busy with schools going in quarantine, and we'll have an update more precisely of that date. We sort of just did a save the date on June 2nd. Just know that that may change slightly. This ends the interview. For the question and answer period, please refer to the next video.